I appreciate the help, Amy. Um, first of all, welcome to everybody uh, to this session. Um, we've been working within the Delaware for quite a few years with the William Penn Foundation, and I, I definitely want to say a thank you to the foundation for supporting Lighthawk's work throughout the watershed. Also, a thank you to every member of the coalition uh, who has helped Lighthawk over the years negotiate and navigate through partnerships uh, to really bring the aerial perspective to everybody's um, conservation project. And I also want to say a, a very strong thank you to Steve Kapp, who's the pilot who actually flew this video flight for us. Uh, pilots, uh, many of you perhaps don't know this, but our pilots are actually donating everything that makes a flight happen from their side of the equation, which means fuel, their plane, their expertise to actually make these flights come together. And, it's, and I really, really appreciate Steve's ability to do this flight. And also Steve will uh, jump in on these, uh, a couple of these sections as well to talk about his perspective of flying for conservation. Um, there will be a link to the video that you're going to see uh, in the chat section. If it's not there, I think it will also be uh, housed on the Lighthawk Facebook webpage, which I think will be a nice place for people to go to and see some additional videos of our work across the country. And finally, if the internet collapses and we are thrust into darkness, uh, know that I will try my best to establish and uh, reestablish connectivity. But if I'm unable to, please have a great day. Continue your great work. Um, it's important, et cetera. Um, and I just want to go into a couple quick introductions. So some of you know me already. Uh, I've been down there for four or five years now, doing a lot of work across the watershed. I'm Jonathan Milne. I'm the Eastern Program Director for Lighthawk. Uh, the Eastern region stretches from Maine to the Dakotas, down to Texas, back to Florida. And we have projects going on all across those landscapes. But the Delaware is a special one for us. Uh, it's what we call a flagship uh, project area where we're able to put a lot of conservation and aviation assets into that area to make sure that we're enabling our partners to really move things forward. And I want to also introduce uh, another very critical team member, which is Audrey. Audrey, can you jump on for a second? Good morning, everyone. Audrey is our Eastern Program Flight Coordinator. Now, back in 2012, I used to do her job, and I know how difficult it is. Audrey is remarkably talented at working with logistics, working with partners, and working with pilots. And to be honest, a lot of this doesn't happen without that expertise. So thank you, Audrey, for all that you do for Lighthawk, all that you do for the Delaware River Project area. And Amy, you can actually start running the video now. I think it'd be great to sort of have a conversation as this video moves upstream and to give everybody a perspective of, of what we're seeing when we're, we're flying these areas. Audrey, could you just comment if you're able to on sort of the specifics of the flight? Um, I'm, I'm thinking more about resolution and altitude. Um, yeah, um, and, and Steve can talk a little bit more about altitude. I think it, um, it differed a little bit across the, the watershed. But um, yeah, so I worked with Steve to, to get this video um, of the first the upper um, stretches of the Delaware um, for this specific purpose, but he also flew a lot of stretches of the lower uh, Delaware. So we will be putting together that uh, video and making that available to everyone. Um, but yeah, essentially, and Steve can talk more about, you know, the, you know exactly how he did this. But we um, worked with him with a Hero 8 GoPro camera, which is kind of the top of the line um, action camera. And it was actually mounted under his plane. And then we, we provided him kind of a route, but he, um, he's flown quite a bit in the watershed, so he knew this pretty well. Um, and we actually asked him to fly this in 4K, which is the highest um, resolution. Um, come to find out on the back end, my computer and, and you know, in, in being able to share things and share screens, as you can see, even uh, yet this lower, basically I had to compress it down a little bit because it, um, some computers just the, the 4K is a little bit hard to see. So in compressing it, it actually, every once in a while, you'll still see that it does jump a little bit. But um, the great part about having such a high resolution is you're able to compress it and you're able to take really um, fantastic stills out of it. And 
And then, you know, when you're working um, with computers and with kind of deliverables that, that um, are able to see the higher resolution, you're able to use that. Um, and Steve, I, I don't know if you can hear me, but um, would you say you were flying this around maybe five to 800 feet uh, above ground? Um, I, I can hear you, Audrey, thank you. Uh, it started out about uh, 800, about 800 feet above ground. Uh, and then as we got into the northern reaches, unfortunately, you know, the mountains, everything gets a little narrower. So it probably opened up or uh, we were around 1,200 feet above ground. And um, Steve, while you're on camera, if you could just give a brief introduction of your background and sort of why you fly for Lighthawk. I'm always curious about the backgrounds and why people come to Lighthawk for their pilots. Well, for those of you who don't know, it's, uh, it's really because of Jonathan and Audrey. I mean, they're just amazing. Um, I had to put that plug in. It's not a paid advertisement, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I joined Lighthawk uh, maybe five years ago. Um, I love to fly. Uh, it's my profession or part of my profession. I sell airplanes for Cessna Aircraft Company, Textron Aviation. Um, so I fly uh, as a result of, of that. But um, thankfully, I'm in a blessed position of my vocation and avocation being one and the same. So uh, to be able to do some flying uh, for the advancement of conservation and um, the environment is just sort of a way to give back. Uh, and I think by flying a float plane, uh, I'm more comfortable flying at lower altitudes over bodies of water than maybe a land plane might be. So I tend to focus, or I shouldn't say focus, I, I enjoy flights over water more than just over land. That's, that's great. Um, I, I want to step back a little bit um, and kind of lay some context for why we're doing video flights now and how we got to this point. So um, early February, I was actually down in Philly with um, Steve Kent, who um, was going to do a flight for myself and Flying Magazine. Uh, I think Flying Magazine had a circulation of a half million readers or something like that. We were going to fly the editor and focus on the, the Delaware River watershed from Philly down to Cape May. And, and thankfully, we got that flight in. We got a lot of great um, responses from both pilots and conservation groups about the work that we're doing there. And shortly thereafter, as we all know, COVID became um, a stuck on our landscape. We at Lighthawk pretty quickly went into a no passenger flight operational status. There's no way to separate people enough in small planes to actually make a flight safe. We're still in that status now. I suspect we'll be in that status into summer of 2021. And previous to this happening, we used to do a few video flights, uh, mostly on the main stem of the Delaware and some other, other locations in that area with one or two pilots who already had that equipment. But our friends at the uh, Walton Family Foundation and our Western program director had uh, connections with both GoPro and an organization called Kind Humans, which is a really interesting group doing really good work across the nation. I'd encourage you to look at their website, see what they're up to. But Kind Humans actually donated eight uh, GoPro Hero 8s to Lighthawk. So we have four of them on the East Coast, four of them on the West. And that's how we're able to start doing video flights that the pilots fly solo, which allows them to do their thing, allows us to work with the conservation partners and think about the best ways that we can capture imagery and footage for a variety of reasons. Um, it could be anything from donor engagement to communication, social media, things like that. And there is a bit of a difference, and Steve might talk to this about the difference between flying a video flight and flying a passenger flight. Obviously, there are obvious, the obvious difference, of, of course. But Steve, does it make it diff difficult or, or easier for you to fly that flight? So that's a great question. And uh, I would say logistically, it's 
easier because you're only coordinating your own schedule and the weather uh, as the pilot. So, you know, you can kind of say, oh, I've got, a, I've got some time this afternoon or whenever, and uh, you can pretty much, you know, do your typical pre-flight activities and jump in and go. Um, you know, Audrey and Jonathan do a great job of handling the logistics of, of coordinating everybody's schedules, but, you know, sometimes you have four, I'm um, picking up three people or two or three people, so you've got their schedules, my schedule, uh, the weather, and, and uh, so on. So, so from that standpoint, logistically, much, much easier. That said, I highly prefer doing the flights with our partners. Um, I have not had a flight yet with those folks where I have not learned something. So uh, I find it much, much more rewarding uh, just, just picking up the, you know, shop talk, if you will, of uh, professional environmentalists or conservationists. And uh, that, that to me, unfortunately, is a little, a little lacking. I'm just li usually listening to music or books on tape when I'm, when I'm flying, um, uh, when I don't need to be on the radio. So it's not, yeah, I highly, I, I hope that comes across that I definitely would prefer in person as opposed to solo video mission. And, and continuing on that, that topic, Steve, um, when you're flying these, um, how are you assessing the perspective? I mean, a lot of conservation partners are looking at main channel issues. Um, when I do conservation planning, I'm looking at the larger context, you know, what is around the Delaware River? What are the inputs coming into that? Um, when you're flying that route, how do you think about that um, in that process? Um, I, I, I enjoy, you know, it's, it's always very helpful for, the, for understanding uh, the organization's requirements, what they're trying to accomplish by the mission. Um, because then uh, as kind of a semi-experienced pilot, you can, you can help uh, structure it in such a way that you can accomplish the goals. Uh, if you fly too high, you're not gonna see a lot of what I call texture of the topography. Um, if, you're, if you're too low, um, sometimes if you're, if you're trying to show the vastness of the space, you know, that, that cuts it down. So, so I would say, uh, you know, a good understanding of, of the ultimate goal of, of the mission for the partner really helps me as a pilot uh, kind of package it or, or make suggestions. Um, uh, does that answer the question, Jonathan? Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to get a perspective of through a pilot's eyes. I'm not a pilot, I'm a conservation professional, so it's, it's always good to hear that, how you look at that. Um, Audrey, if you're still here and able to talk, I'm just curious from your perspective working with partners um, in terms of actually sort of framing a video flight, what, what needs to be in place for that to actually result in a really good output, a really good collection of data and footage? Well, uh, was that directed to me? Sorry, oh, John. That was directed towards Audrey, if she's still okay. here. And she actually may not, because I know she has um, her son, her young son at home. So I guess I'll answer that as well. Um, when I'm looking at flying routes or designing a conservation flight through areas like this. I'm, I'm really trying to think about who the audience is of the conservation partner. So perhaps if uh, it's a donor they want to engage in the future, you know, how do we create sort of a, a, a compelling image, a compelling collection of footage that will engage them, uh, the donor in a different way, you know, engage them that will lead to more financial success for the organization. If it's a stream biologist or a morphologist, how do we focus on the stream channels or the adjacent buffers or the riparian zones? How do we kind of zoom in on that? And as I'm watching this video, it's kind of interesting to assess, you know, what's growing along these landscapes? What, you know, are there invasive plant species such as 
uh, Japanese knotweed, things like that. What are the roads doing? How are they inputting into the water quality issue? How are the fields, agriculture? Um, one thing that really strikes me when I look at videos like this, and it, from a perspective of being in the great state of Maine, which always says it's the most heavily forested state in America, I'm looking at this amazing landscape and video of this, just this forest, this carpet of forest, which is just remarkable to see. And I think it's so important for folks throughout the entire watershed to be able to see something like this. So folks down in Cape May, folks down in Philly, Trenton, wherever the case may be, you know, this, this is a tremendously huge buffer uh, protecting water quality up above that, you know, lends the water down to Philly and Trenton and the bigger, you know, bigger cities down that way. But it's also looking at subject matter. Um, this is great sort of what we call B-roll for video for social media. You can actually take these um, video sets and create small video segments for social media. I do it quite often uh, in my Twitter account. I think it's a really important way to engage your constituencies. But it's also a great way to think about policy. You know, if, um, if you're having issues along these highways that we're seeing here, issues with algal blooms that might be uh, the result of agricultural practices or any other inputs into the water system, what a great way to tell somebody and show somebody, you know, this is what we're seeing. You know, can you comment on that? And I think Lighthawk's perspective has always been, you know, we're trying to share the truth from an aerial perspective without being on one side or the other about, um, what's going on. So it's always important to really kind of think about your audience and sort of create that process that's going to engage them in a much better way. So another way that I also look at videos like this, and we're doing quite a few flights in the Northeast, especially up in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, looking at conservation easements and preserve management. Um, a lot of organizations like the Nature Conservancy chapters and land trusts throughout the country have to do annual assessments of their conservation easements and also their preserves to assess current conditions, see if there are any violations. And we're actually doing this, uh, we'll be doing a flight for the Nature Conservancy in Maine, uh, all video flight that's going to fly about 17 island locations on the coast. And I, I can't understate how much that saves an organization in terms of time, in terms of budget. I used to work for TNC Maine. I used to do this easement monitoring. And we used to take about a week and a half of two full-time employees to do the easement monitoring for these islands. Uh, up in Maine, they can actually do that flight for about two and a half hours and then come home with that information and be able to defend their assessment of the easements or the preserves. And that's a tremendous way to save sort of um, critical budget dollars you know, for organizations that are certainly strapped nowadays during COVID. And, and just the fact that we all can't get out and do what we normally do on these landscapes uh, in, the, in the current COVID landscape is, is really critical. And that's why we think this is just an unbelievably good resource to have and to be able to show people. And I think if Audrey were able to come back on, she would explain that it's really exceptionally easy. And Steve talked about this, how easy it is actually to create a video flight over landscapes, over roads, over river systems, or over power line corridors, as you're seeing in the video right now. It's a really compelling way to tell your story uh, across these areas. Um, yeah, and Jonathan, sorry, yeah. I sorry, I just had to step out for a second. Um, sure. Yeah, I'm happy to speak to that now, or if we want to wait and you know. No, please jump onto it right now. And we'll continue okay. the thread and then jump on to something else. Yeah, and I was going to say, and I I did notice a lot of um, familiar names in the participant list, so that's great. A lot of people that you either worked with or are uh, planning to do some of these flights with. So thanks for joining. 
Yeah, and for those of you that haven't worked with us yet, um, essentially how it works is that we do have a, a partner portal. And so usually it starts with an initial conversation with you and then we'll kind of set you up to make the request. And um, as both Jonathan and Steve kind of talked about, these flights are different in many ways. Um, in that, you know, we've, we essentially try to get everything planned and, and have it all ready to go so that the pilot can, you know, fly this on their own time if possible, if it's not extremely time, sen time sensitive. Um, and so what that kind of entails is, is first and foremost, really um, giving us a really compelling reason for the flight, you know, what you're working on, um, why, you know, aerial video or photos are, um, are if not necessary, you know, might, might add to or complement um, the other resources out there. Um, and how, how this is going to be used. That's always really good for us to know, for pilots to know, because um, they're, you know, they're essentially raising their, you know, virtually raising their hands for these missions and donating their time. So it's really great for them to understand um, the impact that it's going to have. Um, and then I, um, I would work with you to, you know, get all of that information in and then work with you on putting a route together. And with these types of flights, we'll talk a lot about, you know, um, video versus photo, so time lapse photo. I don't know if Jonathan got into that, but that's also an option where we can actually um, tell the camera to take a photo at a certain interval. So that can be every uh, or twice every second, up to once a minute. And so that that's useful for um, you know we're we're experimenting with that for these constellation easement monitoring flights, where they might want a photo versus a video, um, and and then the we can actually talk to the pilot about turning the GPS data on. Um, but we also work with them to kind of get a, um, a duplicate kind of GPS information um, just in case the GPS fails in flight. Um, we'll also talk about camera angles. You know, this one, for instance, Steve set this up. It um, kind of looks like maybe a 45 degree angle, um, which is really great for, you know, this kind of an aerial tour or communications, promotional type um, uses. Others, you know, that are looking at um, uh, eelgrass, for instance, and we worked with Steve Schwartz that are looking at mapping um, invasive Japanese knotweed, those, those would typically be a straight down view. Um, and we, yes, yeah, so we would talk about, you know, what altitude is best for what we're trying to look at. If it's, if it's more of kind of understanding the context and, and kind of the larger landscape, we'll probably fly higher. If you're really looking for really tiny details, as is the case maybe with conservation easement monitoring or these mapping flights in some cases or, or kind of survey flights, we might fly a little lower with the camera angle down. Uh, we'll talk about lighting, you know, time of day, um, route orientation, and basically, yeah, get everything all, all set up, and then the pilots fly these flights, and then we work on, you know, either having them send you the SD card after, um, after the flight, or kind of working with the Dropbox or something like that to upload the video or photos afterwards. So it's, it's maybe a little bit more um, planning on the front end, but um, it's, but then you guys just kind of get to sit back and, and let the pilots do what they do and then and then wait for the product. So yeah, we're really happy with um, with what we've been able to do and you know kind of the, the lessons learned over these last few months. You know, pilots are coming on board pretty quickly. We're learning a ton about how to do this and how to do this well. So we yeah, really love to work with you on these kind of flights. And Audrey, just a, a quick question. I know we've run into some issues with the cameras in terms of battery life. How have we worked within that sort of issue to make sure that the, the video flights actually do what they're supposed to do? Yeah, that is our largest constraint. Um, we are finding, especially these Hero 8s, it's about an hour of flying time um, of, of actually recording. And there's a few pilots, um, specifically one that has done a lot of uh, flights in the Delaware 2 that's um, kind of working through a few different technological, um, I guess, solutions to that. And one is actually just a, a really long USB cord, essentially, that plugs into the camera out on the wing or in the underbelly of the plane, depending on where it's mounted, and then is actually kind of taped along the body of the plane and goes, goes in and is actually plugged in to kind of get around that issue. So we're looking at potentially being able to purchase more of those for the camera so that we are not limited to an hour of flying. But otherwise, yeah, we're sending, we're generally sending pilots a second battery so that, you know, if a flight is two hours, we'll either break it into two or, you know, they're, they're able to see the, um, where they're at in the battery while they're flying, though they might have to land, put in a different battery and then go back up. So that is our, our largest constraint is that battery life and, and hoping to be able to get more of those cords so the pilots are not limited. Um, and thank you, Audrey. Steve, um, 
I'm curious about the day that you flew this. It looks like it was really light winds, maybe a high pressure system that skidded by. Do you remember what the weather was like on that day? Yeah, you, you described it appropriately or accurately. Um, although, uh, while the surface winds were quite low, there was actually, um, at about 3,000 feet, I think the winds were actually around 30 knots. Um, mm -hmm. Thankfully, when I finished this mission, I was heading north, and I, I thankfully had uh, a quite a bit of a tailwind. <laughs> uh, but yes, down down at the surface, as you can see by the uh, by the water, there was very very little wind, uh, very little turbulence, um, which is always a challenge when we're when we're following a water course like this. That that's also uh, something to consider when I'm flying by myself. Um, you know, I can kind of move the plane around a little more aggressively than I would ever do with passengers on board because I don't usually make myself sick. Um, so, yeah, when you're following a, a, a tight and windy river like the upper Delaware, um, sometimes there's uh, quite a bit of, of uh, maneuvering required uh, to, to, to try to keep the shot in frame. Um, sometimes the uh, yeah, and you're trying to you're trying to fly as level as possible without a lot of banking because when you bank, which is the normal way to that we would turn, um, unfortunately the your, your shot slides, you know, your object slides out of the out of the shot. So um, it's kind of an interesting way of flying to try to get keep these images uh, on on target. Yeah, I think you did a great job. It's the video feed, the stream right now is a little choppy, but when you look at it on an individual computer, it's it's exceptionally smooth. And I think it gives a great context, you know, a thousand foot context versus um, a lower uh, perspective. And um, I'm just curious, Steve, when you flew over this, what really struck you the most about the landscape? Um, so uh, this is sort of my uh, my extended backyard, but I, I guess I'd never flown the upper reaches of the Delaware, you know, right up into the reservoir before down this low. Uh, one, I, I was surprised at how mountainous it was. Of course, you know, when you're down low and a lot of times the mountains are or the ridges are above your altitude, it's, you know, um, it adds to that perspective, but I, I really did love. Uh, it was a it was a beautiful day, and I, I loved coming kind of around the turn, knowing the reservoir was going to be there, but how it kind of just appeared uh, from a low altitude. And of course, as a float pilot, <clears throat> even though I'm not allowed to land in that reservoir, it sure it sure was enticing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was. Um, I think that the one thing that you mentioned there was really important, and that is how how you structure a flight route. Uh, you know, when I'm watching the video and you take that right hand turn and then the reservoir opens up, I think that's a really important and compelling uh, perspective for anybody who's thinking about reservoir issues or anything about the landscape or the forests around there that are buffeting the waters there. Uh, one other thing, if I might add, Jonathan. Yes. So one of the things that I really miss about, like here, you know, my mission was pretty simple, right? Follow the Delaware, uh, take pictures of it or take video of it. But what, when, when we have people on board, you know, they may see something that, that is really, really meaningful to their mission. And, and, uh, that allows us to refocus, like, you know, if there was a tributary to this that, that, you know, they didn't think to include in the flight, but they see some activity going on around it that maybe they're concerned, you know, we could just fly over there, circle around it, maybe drop down to a lower altitude, get some high resolution photos or videos, and then continue on with our mission. So, so like sort of the, the, the targets of opportunity, um, I can't think of a flight where we haven't kind of gone off a little bit, off script, if you will, uh, because there was a target of opportunity that, that helped these organizations um, uh, with, their, with their ultimate mission. So, oh. so this, was, this was probably the most focused mission I've ever had because nobody was suggesting, hey, can we go look at this? Um, so anyway, 
Exactly. Um, uh, reminds me of a flight I did with the Nature Conservancy in Maine, assessing easements on islands. We, you know, as as the manager of uh, TNC preserves and easements, um, my colleague had to circle those areas because you have to have that full 360 perspective of what's going on with a given easement or a given parcel. And I agree, that's that's the beauty of flight with passengers is. You know, there may be a coordinate that you're interested in looking at, but, you know, you may be flying up part of this reservoir and see a, a new cut in the landscape. And you may want to be able to shift over a half mile and assess what's going on there. And that's a really critical ability and thing to be able to do for our flights throughout the eastern region uh, that Lehigh works in. Audrey, uh, I'm just curious from your perspective, you haven't seen these eastern regions before in video. What, what's it look like to you when you fly up the upper Delaware River? And she may be with her son right now. Um, I think what I would like to do is just drop, it, drop into sort of a closing transition year and as we kind of cruise up the upper end of the reservoir. And I just wanted to kind of tell a story that I think is a, a very compelling way to think about video flights, but also about passenger flights with Lighthawk. Anything we do across our landscapes is, um, in 2014, I had just come on the Lighthawk uh, as their Atlantic Region Program Manager. And I was doing both jobs, uh, Audrey's job of logistics and also my job of building partnerships and thinking about larger conservation issues. And I got a call from a pilot in Connecticut. He wanted to uh, offer me a flight from Portland, Maine to Santa Fe for an annual meeting in October. And I don't know, I really love commercial flight, but I thought I ought to try uh, just a a plane with a friend and fly across country, which took us three days. But in the back of my head, the night before the flight, I was thinking, how can I share this with either partners or people or anybody who can sort of get a better perspective of what's going on as we are actually real time flying across the country. And it popped into my head and it's just sort of the creative process of how we use flight to push conservation forward. Uh, my wife's a school teacher here in Central Maine. She works with fourth and fifth graders. And while she was very resentful of me departing the area in a private airplane to fly to uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico for four days of fun, I, I talked to her briefly. I said, you know, what if I do a real-time blog by from the airplane to your classroom. And she thought about it for a minute. She said, you think you could do it? And I thought, I think there will be points where I have connectivity and I can either do a tweet that you can show your students or I'll just send photographs and with small captions and descriptions. So here I am, I'm flying from Portland, Maine to Santa Fe. And we're just about to cross the Hudson River. And I notice an algal bloom, what I assume to be an algal bloom from about 6,000 feet. And I snapped a photo and shared that with my wife uh, and her classroom back in central Maine. And it just struck me as an amazing way to engage students across the country and within a watershed. You know, they, he, here are some students in Maine, rural Maine, who will probably never have that perspective, that area of perspective of an amazing river system, you know, the Hudson. And so they're sitting back there in central Maine saying, wow, I've never even known about the Hudson River. So I continued that process across the country. You know, I got to West Virginia, showed them pictures of fracking operations and how that was impacting the landscape got to the crossing of the Mississippi River and shared that with them as well. And it strikes me that, you know, this sort of video um, capture for conservation is a great way to engage every student across the Delaware River watershed. 
And in, in my dreams and my highly caffeinated states that I find myself and I keep thinking about how, how cool would it be to engage um, teachers to in curriculum for students in Cape May, in Trenton, in Philly, in Hancock. So every student across that entire watershed knows what it's like to fly the upper Delaware. Those in the upper Delaware know what it's like to fly down through Philly and down through Cape May. And I, I would encourage everybody who's watching the video, who, who's worked with Layhawk in the past, um, to be that creative. You know, think about how we can engage students, how we can engage everyone who is impacted by the watershed, draws water for drinking, whatever the case may be. Because I, I think you'll find working with Lighthawk is, is really a creativity exercise. You know, I, I don't think I've ever turned down anything that was too, um, that we couldn't accomplish. And even though many of them were creative, um, I would always encourage people to keep that in mind and really think about how to bring the river to as many people as possible because, you know, students are our replacements. Um, I'm getting older and of course, uh, at some point I'll transition away from doing conservation. But, you know, as you look at the picture of Philadelphia that I took from about 8,000 feet, there's lots of students down there who don't know the other sections of the river, you know, where their drinking water is coming from, et cetera. Um, I think it would be a great idea for everybody in the Delaware River Watershed Project to think about, you know, those younger, younger students who they may not know that they're conservationists now, but you know, in 10 years, they, they're gonna get bit by the conservation bug somewhere along the way, I hope. And, and understand that they have this amazing power uh, to change the landscapes and to ensure that clean water continues to flow down through this river and ensure the riparian areas are, uh, you know, intact for all sorts of species. So I guess that's what I would leave everybody with is that thought of being creative using Lighthawk as, as the tool it is, and that is really that aerial perspective to, to bring uh, the Delaware world to as many people as possible. Again, whether it's Cape May, Philly, Trenton, whoever the case may be, I want them to see this. You know, here I am in Maine. I want these kids in Philly to see what Hancock is like. I want them to see what a reservoir is like. And that is, that's sort of the approach we take at Lighthawk across all the areas we work. It's really how do we engage the most humans possible because when we engage humans in this visual perspective we, we go back to what we always say we change hearts and minds and that's ultimately what really gets a lot of work done across the conservation landscape so i would uh open this up for questions right now if anybody has any uh, if you don't have any now and you have any in the future you can contact me directly uh through my email jmill at lighthawk.org or audrey's um, and it's been great. I always love doing this. My only regret is I don't get to torment people face to face, which is really one of my great joys. Um, I used to be a park ranger and that's one of my great talents is to torment people. So uh, I know in 2021, hopefully we'll all be together in Philly again and we'll have a cup of coffee together. So questions if anybody has any. Uh, Jonathan, we have one from the chat. We've got some hands raised and we have one that came in through the chat room. Um, what type of whoops this one up on it uh, what type of cameras are available for example thermal image cameras available and is there seasonal limitation for example if we are interested in doing ice jamming in winter is it doable um, from my perspective yes it is doable we have flown uh, winter flights throughout the country uh, whether it's telemetry flights uh, tracking moose or or flights just to assess what river systems are doing in winter. Yes, we can do that. Of course, in the Northeast, our, our flight windows close a little bit because of weather generally becomes a little bit nasty. So we have to be very selective on the days. And that's always a pilot decision because uh, you know our number one filter is safety. How do we do a flight safely? Our second filter is conservation. You know, Is it worth the flight? excuse me, is it worth uh, burning fuel to actually do this? 
Um, Audrey, can you speak to imaging in terms of infrared and stuff like that? I know we've touched on it a little bit with a couple flights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually Steven, uh, Steve Schwartz is on the call. They, um, they've used a, uh, a near-infrared um, kind of customized uh, Hero 7 GoPro camera. So, um, yeah, for that question, right now, so the, the cameras that we have are the Hero 8s that were donated to us. So those are the ones that we're essentially shipping all over the country to do flights, shipping them to different pilots. Um, you know, if a, if a, pi uh, sorry, a partner was to come to us, like Steve did and say, you know, this is what I want to do. This is the camera I have. And especially if it's, you know, GoPros are really great because they're kind of set up to be action cameras. So there's a lot of mounting systems for them for this, for this kind of thing. Um, but, you know, we, so I guess the short answer is we don't have any uh, thermal imaging cameras, but, you know, I, I do believe those are available on the market. And if we, you know, were to talk to somebody that had one and we can figure out, you know, a mounting system that would work with a pilot and that's the biggest question is you know the the pilot has to sign off on mounting something to, to their plane and some are very comfortable doing that and some are, are less so um gopros are a little bit of a known um a known resource you know they have have quite a few um mounts in the aircraft world and so it would just depend on you know the compatibility of, of that camera to a mount but as jonathan i think mentioned you know we love to be creative. So having that conversation, understanding, you know, what kind of cameras we're talking about, what mounting systems might exist, um, happy to have those kind of conversations. And I believe uh, Suzanne had a question. She's got, so you're unmuted. You can ask your question. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Suzanne Zlotnick. I'm from the Friends of Popwessing Watershed in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And um, <clears throat> I have a question about the film and the use for educational purposes. I'm a certified teacher K through 12, and I've also taught at um, Temple University. So I'm most interested in helping spread the word that's uh, being offered by these beautiful videos. I also am a local composer and I could possibly offer music which could underscore uh, some of the scenery. So I would like to just ask uh, how do I get in touch with the right people to move a project like that forward? Well, I, I, I'll jump right in. You know, please contact me. Um, okay. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm, I'm a huge fan of engaging students, uh, whatever their conservation issue is. I'm also a very huge fan of including other media. Music is essential to setting tone. Uh, I've done a couple of videos that I've shared with people that, uh, I'll, I'll be silly, it nearly made me weep because the imagery and the music came together in such a way that it just, it touched me in a different way. And you know, here I am, a stoic Scottish American man, but you know, it, do, it does reach into our souls how we engage video with music. So uh, be creative, you know, we're, we're in the battle for conservation in so many locations. I say use every tool we can use safely to engage as many people of as many ages and backgrounds as possible. Thank you so much. I recently uh, befriended Ellen Schultz from the Fairmount Waterworks Education Division and um, I think uh, I would love to share this information with her. I think she would be a great ally. Oh great. So I, Jonathan, I'll be in touch. Outstanding. So, uh, Jonathan, do you guys have time for maybe one? We've got, we're just about over time. You want to take one more question? I've got a whole pot of coffee, so I'll go all day talking about Lighthawk and conservation. Um, I've also provided Jonathan and Audrey's contact information in the chat box, so you guys can take that with you post-call and connect with them. And we'll also be sharing this video uh, through the, the forum website shortly. But let's see, with our next question that came through was from Eric Strading. What does one hour flight and provided video or still pictures cost? Well, that, that's one of the beauties of Lighthawk. Um, because we have pilots who are donating their planes, their expertise, their fuels, their fuel, we do not charge our conservation partners a, a, a flight for cost. Um, if we were charging costs, it jumps Lyhawk into a different FAA 
certification and we cannot do that. So our flights are actually essentially free. They're not really free because the pilot bears most of that cost. Um, luckily, we have great friends at the William Penn Foundation that support Audrey's and my work. Uh, and that's essentially how we do that. So if you think about it, that's really amazing that these pilots are donating not only their time away from their full-time jobs or their retirement, but also fuel, also expertise, and also maintenance of their airframe to be sure that we have continual safe operations and amazing outputs from each and every thing. So thank you, Steve. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, the cost, to, like for my airplane, just to put a number on it, is around two hundred and fifty dollars an hour. Um, but th again, that's uh, you know, as long as we want to make the biggest impact possible and and help our uh, help our partners accomplish their mission. So it, it's well worth it when we see it used to good effect. Thanks, Steve. We'll take, let's see, we've, uh, I see Steve Schwartz has his hand raised. Hi, um, we have done five flights with Lighthawk um, and Audrey and Jonathan and Steve are all amazing people. Um, the project is a Delaware watershed conservation funded project to look at invasives, uh, specifically knotweed. And we had the pleasure of flying with Steve for the first three flights um, in 18 and 19. And we learned a lot in terms of the requirements of our project, which are to take very precise uh, aerial photographs of the river corridor to get to Shippensburg to turn into digital maps to calculate the extent of knotweed in the river uh, floodplain. And, uh, and Steve um, is the most amazing pilot because he can drift around all of the little hairpins uh, on the river and follow the sinuous river to keep the plane flat. And uh, it was just amazing. Um, the last two flights this year, we had to do it uh, by setting up all the equipment uh, with the pilot. And, uh, and then having a very precise flight plan pre-programmed pre and, uh, and then he would fly without us on board um, to do the flight. And that was amazing as well. Um, and uh, so we now have like, I don't know, 100,000 photos to sort through um, <laughs> from the various flights. And uh, the cameras that we've mounted have included a still camera, uh, that takes um, photos every half second, and uh, also a converted GoPro infrared, near infrared camera, because uh, we're looking for enough uh, visual imagery to be able to auto generate, to generate an algorithm to auto interpret the knotweed. And so the infrared provides that information as well. And uh, I can provide information on how to get a GoPro that's been converted to near infrared. Uh, but there are many, many, there are many, many different ways to go in terms of the uh, technical equipment and how it's used and how it's programmed and, uh, and uh, you know, how you're, you're planning to take the imagery um, that all depend on the objective of your mission. So first you need to define that. And Jonathan, we have one more question from the chat box that I, okay, I think Audrey just answered it. Do not have any helicopters in the Northeast region. We'll have to work on that one, I guess. Well, there. when I first came in 2012, I think we had two. Helicopters are, are strange devices. They have a lot of moving parts. They're exceptionally expensive to maintain and fuel. And I think that's what happened with those pilots. They just decided that you know, it was too much of a costly endeavor to keep a helicopter going all the time. All right, well, it looks like we are just over our time and we have breakout sessions starting in, at 10 o'clock. So thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Jonathan and Audrey and Steve for leading the session today. And again, the, the 
in the chat box is their contact information should you want to get further information. Thank yeah. you, everybody. Amy, thank you again for coordinating this and all the behind the scenes stuff. It's really essential to these, the crazy world of Zoom. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Get out there. Let's do some conservation. Thank you, Steve.